Grace, mercy, and especially God's peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends of Christ, I wanted to use a message. It was actually the text from two weeks ago. It's one we're familiar with, but um, I'll read it for you again, and, and we're going to talk about the whole chapter 8 of Luke in a little bit, so be afraid. It won't be that long. Just because I haven't preached in a couple weeks doesn't mean I get to all that time back. <laughs> From Luke 8, beginning the 23rd verse, it's, or 26th verse, it says, Then they sailed to the country of the Gesserines, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it had seized him, he was kept under guard and was bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them, let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found a man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gesserines asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might go with him, but Jesus said to him, but Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Here ends the text. I didn't even have his stand today. You can tell him I'm not used to this again. As we begin, in this chapter, we there's something that happens here. It's repeated twice in the scriptures. And the two stories are repeated heel to toe in both Matthew and in Luke. This is the second story where Jesus comes upon the land of the Gesserines and finds this demon-possessed man. The story that precedes it is when Jesus is, is, gets in a boat. The crowds have become a, too, a little too much for him. They've, they've just worn him out, and he gets into the boat, and he's sleeping, and they travel across the Sea of Galilee. Now, in case you've never been to Israel or never really visualized what the Sea of Galilee looks like, it's more of a lake. You can literally see from one side to the other. It's not a giant sea when we think of the word sea, but it sits in a, in a valley on both sides, and the winds come in and can whip up a storm really quick there. And so on the way there, Jesus has, has left the crowds on this other side of the Sea of Galilee, which was in Israel. He gets in the boat, and he's tired. He sleeps, and on the way there, the storm whips up. And the disciples wake him up, and they're afraid. They say, aren't you afraid? We're going to drown. And Jesus gets up and says, be still. And the waters are still. And suddenly, it says, the disciples are afraid. They're more afraid now because they were afraid of the storm, but now they're more afraid of the person who controls the storm. And we come from that text into this, where Jesus sets foot. And I titled this message, Now What? Because... Do we ever think about the human cost, the physical cost to Jesus for his ministry? Sure, he was the son of God, he was God himself, but he took on human form. There are times when you get tired and you just go, I can't take anymore. Sometimes we get tired and we get a little grumpy. Now, of course, I love the t-shirt that says, sometimes I wake up grumpy and other times I just let him sleep. I enjoy that. <laughs> but, see, I didn't say let her sleep, so I, I'm, I'm protecting myself. 
But what happens here is there's a cost. There's a cost to anything we do, a physical cost, a mental cost. When we go on vacation, we had a wonderful vacation, and thanks everyone for, uh, for allowing us to go. Thanks everyone for asking and saying you're glad we're back. But before you go on vacation, you really wonder why you're going because you, you work so hard to get everything packed up. We have a trailer, we pack everything in the trailer, and then we go and, ha, ah, I'm not sure whether we're resting from our year or from just getting ready to go. And then we come back, and for three days, the trailer sat in front of our house while we unload everything we brought in. And you wonder, was vacation really worth it? Jesus is here doing ministry, and the people are not leaving him alone at all. They're, they're constantly with him, because who wouldn't want to be with God? But they're with him, and, and the cost is, is physically draining. Quite often, he would go off by himself to pray. You know, there are times when, I, I love Luther said if he was busy, you know, he would pray an hour every morning. And he said if he had a very busy day, a very stressful day ahead of him, he prayed for two hours. He didn't say, well, I, I'm going to forego prayer because I don't have time for it today. He said, no, I really need prayer, so I'm going to pray twice as long. Jesus would go off by himself to pray. And the disciples were constantly going, when's he coming back? Where is he? Why does he need this? He's in the boat on the way over to Gesserines. He's asleep because he's tired, and the storm is coming, and they're going, they wake him up. Aren't you, don't you care about us? Aren't you afraid? And Jesus says, be still. And suddenly the disciples are all quiet because they're more afraid of the person that's in the boat than the storm that was outside the boat. And then he lands on the shore of the of Gesserines, and we can tell he's not in Israel anymore because there's pigs there. You can't have pigs in Israel. They're unclean animals. As a matter of fact, the, the, the law says the, the, the unclean animals should not set their foot on the land of Israel. And so what happens in Israel, they do have pigs. They just put them on platforms. Anytime you make the law, somebody will figure out a way around it. <laughs> So they have pigs in Israel, they just don't touch the ground. But so as I said, immediately before arriving, the Bible tells us the disciple woke him up during a storm of, in Galilee. And then the now what? Jesus is trying to take a break, if you will. He's trying to take a break, but the first thing that happens, he's, he's confronted by a naked crazy man as he gets out of the boat. I don't think there's probably anything more confusing to people than a naked crazy person. When I was on the school board in Wisconsin, we, we, were, we had our school board meeting and the principal for the elementary school arrived late to the meeting and, and we, you know, we were kind of sticklers of starting on time and we said, where were, he said, before he asked, he says, I got to tell you what happened. He said, the question came to me what do you do with a naked child? He said, now let me explain. We had a, we had a, we violated our own rules in the fact in our school, we had a area where most of the kids that caused trouble in our school came from, it was right at the edge of the district. And so we would pick them up on the bus last. And we'd drive them right to school so there wouldn't be too much turmoil on the bus. Now the rule was that if you were picked up, uh, if you were picked up first, you got off first. If you were picked up last, you got off last. But we broke that rule because we wanted these kids off the bus in the afternoon because they caused problems. So we loaded them up and we drove them straight back to the area where they lived. And so all our buses had radios because it gets quite cold in Wisconsin and they might need to call for help. And the bus driver was warm, but the bus driver said, the principal says, the bus driver called him and said, what do I do with a naked kid? He said, what? Well, this first grader had sat on the bus and had stripped all his clothes off and was sitting there naked. And the principal said, when's his stop? He said, next. He said, just let him off. And so he said, I've been sitting in my office now for the past hour waiting for the phone call. It never came. 
That kid showed up naked at his front door and his parents never even thought to call and say what was going on. Kind of showed why the problem he had. But then Jesus gets to Gasserines and he's confronted by this crazy naked person right in front of him. And we find out that demons, that, un, that unclean things cannot stand in the presence of God. You see, demons are subject to God because God is greater than them. He confronts them. They, they say, please, don't send us into the abyss. Even the demons don't want to go to hell. The demons escape from hell. They don't want to be confined there. They know how bad it is. And they say, send us anywhere. Send us into these unclean animals, these pigs. And so we know Jesus is not in Israel because of the pigs. But then we get this shared response, and this is where I said we're going to talk about Luke chapter 8 a little bit. You see, in Luke chapter 8, there are a number of stories, and every one of them has to do with about who is greater. We don't often think of them that way, and that's why I wanted to share this with you. We begin Luke chapter 8 with the, with the women who are accompanying Jesus. We find out about those who are Mary Magdalene and, and uh, Clophis and uh, Joanna, and Susanna, these are the women that are accompanying them and bankrolling the, the ministry. For those who say that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, that's a, that's a false teaching that the early church brought on for whatever reason, I don't know why. The only thing we know about Mary Magdalene in her history is that seven demons were driven from her. And out of thankfulness, she now follows after Jesus and, and helps support the ministry. Next in Luke 8, we get the parable of the sower. And we talk, Hank did wonderful about talking about being missionaries. And it's scary to be a missionary. And I often say this should be called the parable of the seed because, of the, or the parable of the ground, because the sower just spreads the seed. And God says, don't worry about the return. When you spread the seed, God says, I'll take care of it. I'll cause the seed to grow. But it's your task to spread the seed. Don't be afraid. Harkens back to the book of Joshua when the Israelites entered in, and the Israelites entered the promised land, and God promised them, everywhere you set your foot, I will give you. But they didn't conquer Israel, all the holy land, because they didn't go. There are things in our lives which cause us to become afraid. Sometimes we don't go places because we're afraid. It gets late at night, we go, I don't want to go out after dark. We go, well, I'm not going to go to the doctor because the doctor only gives me bad news. I'm not going to go to the dentist because, you know, I, I, don't want, I don't want to hear that I have a cavity. You know, these things which cause us fear, which later, if we, if we put off, if we ignore, can cause us greater pain or greater problems. Jesus tells the, the disciples the purpose of the parables is, is to proclaim the word of God. He says, don't be afraid and hide your light under a basket of chapter. And then he hides, excuse me, and then he gets in the boat. And he's asleep and he comes after. And after this, we'll get to that in a second. The shared response of the people of the Gesserines and the people of, of, in the boat, the disciples in the boat, was they were afraid. You see, they were afraid of what God did. They were afraid of the power of God. They thought... They thought they had everything in control until they came into the concept, until they came into the presence of the true God. What if God were here today? What if Jesus came walking in? Would the church recognize him? Would the church recognize Jesus? You know, most of all, every time Jesus appears to anyone, they are afraid in his first words, do not be afraid. Fear not. 365 times in the scriptures. You know, when God repeats himself, we need to pay attention. When the story of the, of the disciples in the boat is repeated from Matthew and Luke, when the story of Jesus and the Gesserines and the demonic possession is repeated in Matthew and Luke, we need to pay attention. God is trying to get our attention. When he repeats something 365 times, one for every day of the year, do not be afraid. He's trying to get our attention. What are we afraid of? 
And so if God were here, what would be our response? Man, we wouldn't want to leave. We recognize God and we would, you know, we would say, we're sinners, God. And he said, I love you. And they said, I want to go with you. That's what happens to the man who's demon-possessed. So demon-possessed that they tried to protect him from himself. They shackled him, they chained him, and he would break loose. He didn't live in a house because he, he couldn't, be, couldn't be confined. He lived among the tombs. He was, they were, they'd given up on him. And Jesus cleanses this man from all the demons. And the people from the town come out and they're afraid because, oh my goodness, if he can affect this change, what change is going to be effective in my life? You see, that's what scares people is about the relationship with God is, is, is it's going to change my life and, and thank, thank goodness it will. The man wants to stay with Jesus. He wants to get in the boat. He wants to go with him. And Jesus tells him, return home and tell what God has done for you. You see, this is what it is to be a missionary. To go someplace, to return to your home, to, to go another place and tell what God has done. To share the good news. Because truly this is the greatest news we can have. The news of forgiveness, the news of love, the news of, of God being with us. God came to us today in the sacrament. He came to us through the hearing of his word. He comes to us now and he says, now go. Tell everyone what God has done for you. And so our lessons from this text may be that God is, may, he may not be calling you to go to a foreign land as a missionary. Not, not all of us are called to be, are, are given the gifts of being a missionary. When I was in seminary on the way back from a trip to Israel, the, the head of the mission department said, would you like to be a missionary to Jerusalem? I said, I don't know if I could live my life with a handful of converts, five to ten converts probably among the Jews and among the Muslims there. And I don't know if I don't know if if I would be able to think that I was successful. Ooh, a terrible word in ministry. We're not called to be successful in our faith, we're called to be faithful. So God may not be calling you to go. But he may be calling you to stay home and share the good news. As Hank said, it's not only the children that can share the good news with their, with their friends across the street. It's each one of us that can share the good news. That can guide conversations when somebody says, boy, I was lucky. And you say, oh, I don't believe in luck, but I believe God blessed you. To turn the conversation to God and say, I don't, I don't always understand his plan or his purpose, but I know of his love. I know that even in the times, in the darkest times, God will not abandon us. He will shine in our lives if we give him the room. So as we go forth this day, let us rejoice in the message of God with us. Let us recognize that the things we fear in this world, whatever it is, whatever it is that you fear, whatever is causing you to worry or wonder, know that God is greater than it. That more likely God can step in and, and, and cause a miracle to occur. What to you would be a miracle? The calming of the storm. The healing of the demon-possessed man. And at times we will suddenly go, Wow, I should be a little more afraid of God. Not afraid, but respect. You don't get the warnings here that we get in the Midwest. Every time there's a storm, the warnings come on and say, be careful of down power lines. Because, you know, they're, they're still contained power, they might kill you. I've never understood why people needed that warning, because not, you know, down power line is not the thing I say, hey, let's go pick that up. But there's power there that people don't recognize. There's power in the name of God. There's power in the presence of God that people of this world don't often recognize. And when we do, it is amazing. It will transform our lives. It transformed the life of the demon-possessed man. It has transformed all our lives. And let it continue its transformation. Because truly we have a God who is, who is above all things. We have a God who loves us so much, who tells us 365 times, do not be afraid. 
May God give you courage. May he give you strength. May he give you his presence this day. Amen. Let us rise.